there are certain turning points in history that, that change everything as soon as they happen. I remember one time watching the Civil War documentary done by Ken Burns. And he talks about uh, the unique viewpoint of a Southern man, at least from his estimation. He says every Southern man can look back in time to Gettysburg when they're standing on the field right before Pickett's charge and when the war hadn't yet been lost. But as soon as they crossed that field, at least by his estimation, the war was already over and nothing was ever going to be the same. You can go back in time to December 7th, 1941, on that Sunday morning, right before the planes fly up over the top of the, uh, top of the skyline and begin bombing Pearl Harbor. And it's a totally different world after that, isn't it? Everything changed. I can think back when, to when 9-11 took place. I, before that event took place that morning, I was going about my business when I was a student at the seminary. And now after that, you just knew everything was going to change, and, and it has. You see, there are some turning points that when they happen, they just leave everything different. Nothing's ever the same. And the same is true as we look at our situation that we're going to look at today in Acts chapter 16, where the Apostle Paul meets a Macedonian man. We read from Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word of God in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You know, sometimes it's from closed doors that we find the greatest opportunity. The Apostle Paul is going about his mission journey, and if you remember, he had visited the congregations that, that, that he had visited in the first mission journey. And so really the area that's right behind me on the map is where he had been. And the next logical place for him to go would be either to go up to Bithynia or Asia. And so as he leaves, you can kind of look behind me and see those congregations. As he heads up, uh, he decides to try to go into Asia. But it says he's kept by the Spirit from entering Asia. It's not that God doesn't care about the people in Asia. In fact, in Paul's third missionary journey, you're going to see Paul go through those areas. If you read in the book of Revelation, for example, the seven churches that are written to are seven churches in that province of Asia. It's just that God didn't want Paul there yet. He tries to enter Bithynia to the north. And, and he's kept, it says, by the Spirit of Jesus from entering there. And it's not that God doesn't care about the people in Bithynia. The Christian church would have a long and full history in that region. You can see one of its chief cities, Nicaea, is a city from which we get the Nicene Creed. It's just that that wasn't going to be Paul's call. Paul, on the other hand, is called to enter Europe by this Macedonian man. And as he's called there, despite all the closed doors he's found, he finds amazing opportunity. You see, sometimes one of God's most powerful tools is to slam doors in our face so that instead we find opportunity where there didn't seem to be any. We read about that opportunity as we continue in Acts chapter 16. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Neapolis where we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Philippi becomes the first city that Paul goes to, and it's called the, the gateway to the east. It was an important city in those days because it really was where Europe gave way to Asia. 
He was named after Philip the Macedonian, the father of Alexander the Great. And so it seemed like a fitting place to begin. And when they get there, there's no synagogue. And so they go down by the river, perhaps hearing that there might have been some Jews worshiping there. And they meet a woman named Lydia. It says God opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And that's always how it goes. Paul wasn't there to try to argue people into the kingdom of God. Faith doesn't work that way. Instead, Paul was just being a messenger. He just shared the word of God, and the Holy Spirit used it to bring people to faith. And it shouldn't surprise us. You see, people long for this. They need to know the answer to their guilt, to their fear, to their shame, to their death. They need to be introduced to the God who made them and created them. People try to find the answers to these things in all the wrong places. It's only in Jesus the question is answered. And so Paul stays at Lydia's house. But the devil, he won't give up without a fight. Continue reading in Acts chapter 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. That moment, the Spirit left her. A girl possessed by an evil spirit is not exactly the kind of messenger that you want, huh? God is not a God who rants and raves. And even if that, that woman possessed by the evil spirit was saying something correct, the way in which she delivered that message was in and of itself a deception of the devil. And so Paul, he drives that evil spirit out. And he did her an immense favor to stop being tortured by this evil spirit, to have a clear mind once again. But the people who owned her, they had lost their moneymaker. And so we see this situation develop. We continue in those verses. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into the prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. This isn't about their gods. This isn't about their laws. This is about money. And greed loves to find other things to blame so it can hide its, its black face, but, but money ultimately is what it was all about. They work up this crowd into a frenzy. They arrest Paul and Silas without a trial. They're stripped. They're beaten. It says they're flogged severely and put in stocks. Just imagine what that night was like as they sat there with, with, with their bodies throbbing, bleeding, in immense pain. Add to it the, the, the torture of the stocks. Just being stuck in one position. I mean, try that once. Take a long car trip where you're crammed between a couple people, unable to adjust your legs, and just think of what it would be like to spend a whole night that way. And yet, maybe their reaction surprises you. We continue reading in Acts. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Paul and Silas' reaction wasn't to curse God or the Macedonian man who called them. It was to sing praises to God. You see, they ran to the place that Christians always run to, a refuge, our strength, a God who's bound himself to us in his promises, who will not let us down. And suddenly there's an earthquake. It says that the, the doors of the jail bust open, the chains fall off. And what happens next? That's surprising. We continue. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. 
The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What's surprising about this section isn't necessarily that the jailer burst in and his first reaction was to kill himself. You see, according to Roman law, if, if his prisoners escaped, he would receive the judgment that they faced. And who knows who was in that prison, but if the jailer was thinking about the possibility of him being crucified and beaten and treated the way some of these prisoners were treated, perhaps suicide seemed like the best option to him. What, what's amazing is that when the lights are on, he sees Paul and Silas sitting there, and all the doors are open, the chains had come loose. His first action isn't to put the chains on, it's not to shut the doors. Instead, you see what he does? He runs up to Paul and Silas, he falls on his knees, and he asks them that question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why does he act like that? It's because he realized that whether he was to die that night or 50 years from that point, at some point he was going to come face to face with his Lord. And he had no answers. He didn't know who he was, what he had done for him. He didn't understand how to deal with the shame and the guilt he felt. He had no answer for death. You see, at that moment, his biggest problem had nothing to do with the jailers or the jail or what the Roman officials might do to him. His biggest problem was bigger than that. He had no idea who his God was or where he stood with him. And so Paul answers. We continue reading in Acts 16. They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his household. You see their answer? It wasn't something you do. Believe in the Lord Jesus isn't something that comes by considering the evidence and making a decision. It's not something we work up on ourselves. Instead, just like it works for Lydia, God opened the jailer's heart. He opens our hearts. He uses the power of his word to work that miracle of faith. Anybody who has stared that statement in the face had someone tell them, just believe, knows how impossible that is. We simply cannot make ourselves believe in a God we've never seen. But that God, he comes to us. And he works through the word of God that's shared, just like it's shared with the jailer. And he works through the waters of baptism that's shared with us, just like it was shared with the jailer and his family. And he leads us to believe, just as God called him, just as, just as he said. The amazing power of God's word to work on the human heart is on display. You see, the officials, they had a problem on their hands now. Paul and Silas, they were Roman citizens, and they had been arrested, beaten, tortured without a trial. This wasn't okay. The next day, the jailer brings him to them, tells them the situation. The leaders, they just kind of want Paul and Silas to go away, but Paul and Silas, they won't do that. They had been wronged, and, and they needed publicly to make sure everybody understood this was not okay. It was not just for Paul and Silas, but for the jailer, his family, for Lydia herself. And so after they're escorted out of the prison by the officials, they say goodbye to Lydia, and they go on their way to Thessalonica. We continue reading, or we have a chance to see that on the map. If you look over here, you have a chance to see flip by where they went, and the next city down then is Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, they see much the same thing. We continue in Acts chapter 17. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here 
and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They made Jason and the others pull his bond and let them go. It's the same scene. See, this is all that the darkness can do when it rages against the light. It creates lies and hatred and disrest and riot, and then it blames it on the light. We see it happening here in Thessalonica as Paul comes once again. He shares the word of God. Some believe, others reject. The ones who reject, they work the people up into a frenzy, and they get them driven out of the city. But God's word still works. It's not the end of the story for the Christians in Thessalonica. Instead, you can read about them in the book of Thessalonians. But Paul and Silas, for their part, they continue. And they go on now to Berea, which you see is right next to Thessalonica. And Berea is a, fresh, a breath of fresh air. Continue reading about the Christians in Berea in Acts 17. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. This was so refreshing for them because they didn't just take their word for it. They didn't say whatever Paul and Silas would ignore them, and they also didn't work the people up to a riot. Instead, they heard what Paul and Silas said, and they looked to Scripture to see if it was true. They examined God's Word. You see, that's how questions are dealt with among Christians. That's the way it should be done. Not with empty accusations, not by pushing blame here and there, not just with our reason, but by going back to Scripture and seeing what God has to say there. And so Berea becomes this oasis in the midst of conflict. A reminder of the important work that Paul and Silas have been called there to do by God himself. However, the people from Thessalonica, they work the people up into a riot. They, they, they come over to Berea and they end up getting Paul and Silas expelled. But you know, maybe God didn't need Paul and Silas there. At least nearly as much as he needed them in Athens. And so you see what happens is they go from Berea, and then they head all the way down to Athens. And Athens was in well past its heyday. At one point, it, it had been a place for, for Greek thought, a center of learning, but, but now it was well past its prime. And Paul found himself, though, still in a place that loved to talk about new ideas. You see, they were searching for the truth, but they were fishing in the dark. Continue reading in Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what's this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, If we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, you're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. You see, they wanted to know the truth. Why else do you sit there and listen to all these different ideas unless you want to really get down to, to what really matters, what really is truth, and what is error? The problem is they had no idea what it was. And as Paul walked around the city, as he sees all their idols, he can see a people that are fishing in the dark, who want a connection to the Creator, but have no idea who He is or where to begin. Paul uses this as a point of contact. And we read about that in his speech to the Athenians, beginning in Acts 17. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Do you see Paul's point? 
He walked around the city and he would have seen a, a idol for the god of war, an idol for the god of the harvest, an idol for the god of the sun and the moon and the sea and everything under the sun. And they even had this altar to an unknown god so they could cover their bases. Because when you begin to worship everything, you realize that you're going to miss something inevitably at some point. You see, that altar to an unknown god was proof. They had no idea who they were dealing with. They could see what God had made. They just didn't know anything about the God who made it. You see, our God is a God who hides himself. He doesn't just come out and, and talk to you like I'm talking to you in front of the camera today, but instead he, he comes to us through the waters of baptism, through the power of his word, through the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper, through the message of a messenger. And that's where he leads you to know him. But, but he doesn't hide himself because he doesn't want us to know him. Instead, he sent the Apostle Paul to reveal himself. And we hear about how Paul reveals himself as we continue in this section of Acts. We read, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. You see, the folly of the Athenians is that they're treating God as if God were a construct of our imagination, as if we invented him or we made him. It's exactly the opposite. I mean, the God that we have, any God worth worshiping, is a God who's a whole lot bigger than something we can make with our hands, like some idol out of wood and stone. It's God who made the heavens and the earth, the seas and everything in them. The God who set us in the lives that, that we live and the places that we live and put before us the acts and the opportunities that are before us. That's a God we worship. And he, he's not something we build. We don't control him. And he doesn't sit in heaven waiting for us to placate him with our offerings and our groveling. They completely misunderstood who our God is and what our relationship with him is. You see, they didn't understand grace. And so Paul continues. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. You see, he brings him from an unknown God to a known God. He shows them a God who doesn't sit in the shadows, but who wants us to know who he is and goes to such great lengths to do so. Even sending a Macedonian man calling Paul and Silas over to Europe so that they would have this opportunity to have this discussion about who their God is and what he has done for them. And so they could know that, that God is not a God that can be controlled by them. And that's good. That instead, God is a God who comes to us, who saves us because of his love for us, his grace. The Apostle Paul has this discussion with them, and he continues by taking them from this unknown God to Jesus. And so we continue then from Athens. And Athens, then, he sees a little bit of success, but not a lot. It says a few people believe. And then from Athens, he continues to Corinth. And as we read about Corinth, we see a place where God says there's immense opportunity, even though at first it doesn't seem that way. We continue reading in Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be in your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. It's wearing thin on Paul. 
Same thing takes place. He goes to another city. He starts at the logical place. He starts at the synagogue. And when he gets to the synagogue, he shares with them the good news that the Savior they had been waiting for had come. That his name is Jesus Christ. He had lived. He had died. He had risen. And he's there as his messenger. And the same thing happens. It always seemed to happen. Some believe and some reject. And the ones who reject, they just make his life miserable. And you could almost imagine an angry Paul just packing his bags fiercely, ready to go to the next town. When God steps in, you see, in the midst of all these closed doors, once again, God sees opportunity. We continue reading in Acts 18. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. I have many people in this city, he said. There we see this practical use of what we call the doctrine of election. The fact that you and I are Christians, not because of our decision or because of anything about us that, that's good or noble, but simply because God chose us. And he used the power of his word, shared through a messenger, to call us into his family, to bring us into his kingdom. You see, Paul didn't know it yet, but God saw all kinds of opportunity. People that he had chosen and that God had sent Paul there to reach through his message. Where there seemed to be nothing but closed doors, once again, there was opportunity. Now think about your life. God is the one who's given your life and all the opportunities in front of you. And just as there were in Corinth today in your life, there are people that need to hear about the Word of God. There are people that God has chosen. And you don't have to win them. You don't have to argue them into the kingdom of God. You and I simply have an opportunity to be messengers, to take this Word to share it with others. And it is an urgent mission because people so desperately need it. Think of the Athenians as they're fishing in the dark for some connection to their creator. Think about the people in Philippi, the jailer and his family. To this day, there are people out there who are lost, who need the truth found only in Jesus. And God has given you opportunities with the people in your life to share it with them. You might look around you and see nothing but closed doors, just like Paul did, but oftentimes God uses those closed doors to reveal some of the greatest opportunities. I hope you'll join us this Saturday and Sunday as we have a chance to look more closely at the story of the jailer at Philippi. We're going to have a Bible study after our worship service on Saturday at 5.30 and on Sunday um, after our worship service, the, the service takes place at 9 a.m. So worship, the Bible study will be about 10, 15. We'd love to have you join us in person, or you can see the one on Sunday um, on YouTube or Facebook. We'd love to have you join us then. Lord's blessings on the rest of your day.